But our next guest works at an organization that promotes similar ideas around design, construction, and the environment while countering the impacts of climate change. James Connolly, Vice President of Product and Strategic Growth at the International Living Future Institute, joins me now from Seattle. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So for people who might not be aware, what are some of the most devastating ways that climate change is impacting existing architecture? Yeah, well, I think the, the recent heat wave that happened across Paris is a great example of the urgency of climate action that's needed right now. And so are there any examples that come to mind in terms of the, some of the historic structures that are currently being threatened by climate change? Yeah, well, I would maybe want to take a couple steps back to answer that question. Um, there's many historic structures that are threatened by climate change right now. It's a, it's a worldwide issue. Um, and in order to combat climate change, we need to think differently about how we're designing buildings. We need to design buildings of the future. That's what my organization does through the Living Building Challenge, which in Chinese is Sheng Ming Jianju Tiao Jian. We design buildings that are zero energy, zero car carbon, are actually naturally resilient and able to handle this dramatic climate change that we're going through right now. And that can certainly work for some of the newer buildings, but say, for example, the world's first subway system, the London Underground, built back in the 1890s. What sort of options are available when it comes to retrofitting or upgrading a system in a city that already has limited space and a growing population in the city? Yeah, that's a great re question, Rochelle. So, you know, it turns out actually that the way that we used to design buildings before we had modern technology like HVAC meant that we had to use natural methods for ventilation. We had to use thermal mass for cooling. So actually, many of our projects are retrofitting existing buildings to become living buildings. And that's critical because we have so many existing buildings that are part of our building stock. Overall, buildings contribute 40% to climate emissions. So designing zero energy living buildings and retrofitting our existing stock is critical for combating global climate change. So walk us through how you would do something like that in, say, a city like Paris, when they're trying to navigate these record temperatures and structures that don't have air conditioning. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And the reason they don't have air conditioning is because when they were designed, air conditioning didn't exist. But as temperatures go up, air conditioning is going to be, become more and more important because they weren't designed for that type of heat, um, those historical high lows or those historical highs. So there's actually new technology coming on the market, heat pumps that are much more efficient than traditional heating and cooling systems. And, and we're finding that retrofits are actually great opportunities to apply principles like zero energy. Obviously, you have to be careful. You have to respect the culture of the place. Uh, but it's certainly possible to upgrade our existing building stock. And what are some of the challenges that you tend to run into when, when you're trying to retrofit these spaces? Yeah, I think the historical issues are the most critical ones, respecting the space, the character of the building. But like I said, many of these buildings actually have really good bones. Uh, they were designed in a context in which we didn't have a bunch of fossil fuels to power an HVAC system, so they have great natural responses to the climate. Um, so if we can take advantage of those natural responses and then augment them with our new energy efficiency technologies, we can have high quality space that's also low energy consuming and friendly for the climate. And then looking at future builds, how can and should architects account for climate change when it comes to new structures? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, buildings are 40% of global climate emissions. Um, so if we're really going to tackle the main sources of carbon emissions, we need to think about our building stock. And what we do with the Living Building Challenge is we encourage designers to think about buildings as sort of their own power plants, generating all their own energy from their roof. And we're actually figuring out ways in which living buildings can become carbon sinks. So the materials that are actually used in the design and construction can be made of materials that are fundamentally carbon sequestering. In that way, living buildings can actually reverse global warming, not just prevent its worst, worst effects. Now, James, we know that a lot of people are really trying to maximize their space. So how tough of a sell is it now, say, versus a decade ago, to have companies include climate change considerations at the inception rather than as an afterthought in construction? Yeah, I think that's critical. If you're going to achieve an aspirational standard like the Living Building Challenge, it needs to be thought of at the beginning through an integrated design process. And similar to what you're describing, many of the companies that we work with, uh, from Google to Salesforce, 
are starting to think of each project and actually their entire real estate portfolio as buildings of the future, buildings that are zero energy, uh, that are adaptable to the changes in global climate change, and they're using our framework, the Living Building Challenge, right from the outset to think about their global real estate portfolio. All right, James Connolly there, Vice President of Product and Strategic Growth at the International Living Future Institute.